I'm Mike Wallace. This is Biography. Our story, Jackie Robinson. He was the first Negro to play Major League Baseball. An aggressive competitor, he asked no quarter and gave none. But he won the admiration of players and fans alike with his skill and daring. From the very first, he made it clear that he wanted to be accepted on the basis of his ability. I came here, he said, to play baseball. On April 15, 1947, at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, Jackie Robinson makes his first appearance as a Major League Baseball player and shatters a half century of tradition. In the coming months and years, his courage and his character will be severely tested. Jackie Robinson is uniquely prepared to meet this challenge. Born in 1919 on a cotton plantation near the town of Cairo, Georgia, Jackie Robinson is six months old when his father deserts the family. Mally Robinson and her five children are forced to leave the one-room cabin on the plantation. The family sets out on a long journey in search of a new home. The trip ends in Pasadena, California, where Mally Robinson's brother has found a place for them to live. My mother had a strong sense of dignity and pride. She tried to teach all of us to stand up for what we believed. It wasn't easy at first. We were the only Negro family in the neighborhood. The only playmates I had were my brothers and sister. I went to school with my older sister, Willa May, when my mother worked. I was too young to go to classes, so I waited outside. I learned to get along on my own, to make up my own games, and I played them by my own rules. It seemed to me I always wanted something, and I couldn't have it. The best I could do for a baseball was a wad of rags, and I used to think if I ever could hold a real baseball, my life would be complete. I had to be a little bit better, or I couldn't get the play. I wanted to win, all kids do but it meant a little bit more to me. Winning somehow took the sting out of being the outsider. My brother Mac was the star of the school's track team. When he was picked for the United States Olympic team in 1936, I was a proudest kid in the block. The 1936 Olympic Games are held in Nazi Germany. Boasts Adolf Hitler, the pure-blooded Nazi Aryan will prove his supremacy in this arena. The competition does produce a Superman but he is neither Aryan nor Nazi. He is America's great Jesse Owens. Mac Robinson is proud to play second to Owens in the 200 meter dash. Mac set the example for me, says Jackie. And at Pasadena City College, he drives himself relentlessly in practice and competition. In 1938, he breaks Mac's record in the broad jump, establishing a new mark for himself. Jackie enrolls at UCLA in 1939. He has a vague idea that he wants to become a high school athletic coach, but his future plans are hazy, still uncertain. Football is the major sport at UCLA, and Jackie quickly becomes a mainstay of the team. He was a take-charge guy who hated to lose as a friend. And you could be sure that big number 28 would always be in the thick of the action. He is the leading ground gainer in collegiate football in his first season, averaging 12 yards per carry. A newspaper man called Jackie the gridiron phantom. Jackie sees each game as a personal battle in which he must prove he's better than any man on the field. In one game against Stanford, he makes a spectacular punt return, although to begin with, he's surrounded by a host of Stanford players.
Jackie stars in baseball, basketball, and he wins the national championship in the broad jump. In his senior year, he is called the best all-round athlete in America, the greatest Negro athlete of all time. Unquestionably, writes one reporter, he is the Jim Thorpe of his race. Jackie serves as an army officer during World War II and returns home in 1945 to face an uncertain future. I tried to get a job as a high school coach, but there were few openings I could fill. I was 26 years old. I had no job, only a mammal full of trophies. He is an extraordinary athlete, and he longs to play professional baseball. But by gentlemen's agreement, no Negro is given the opportunity to play in the major leagues. Baseball booms in the post-war era. Fans flock to the ballparks as familiar stars return from military service. Men like Stan Musial, Ted Williams, and Joe DiMaggio. Negroes have the chance to play baseball for pay only in a segregated league. Robinson is delighted when the Kansas City Monarchs of the Negro American League offer him $400 a month to play ball. The pay is irregular, crowds are small, and playing conditions are poor. But Jackie Robinson is doing what he likes best. Campaigning for re-election in New York, Governor Tom Dewey begins a movement to wipe out racial restrictions in baseball. Most major league teams resist Dewey's suggestions. One man, however, Branch Rickey, secretly makes plans to break baseball's color line. The dynamic, outspoken general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers sees the Negro athlete as an untapped reservoir of talent. And as his Dodgers begin their training at Bear Mountain, he is already scouting Negro players. But Ricky knows that the first Negro to play Major League Baseball must be able to endure constant threats of physical violence, racial insults, even hostility from teammates. Ricky narrows his choice to a handful of men. He considers the brilliant but erratic Satchel Paige in his 40s and still pitching. The powerful, placid Roy Campanella. Don Newcomb, fiery young pitcher, and an infielder named Jackie Robinson. Ricky feels Robinson has intelligence, ability, courage, but he must be sure he is the right man. Robinson is summoned to his office for an interview. Branch Ricky tells about that first meeting. He was everything that I had hoped he would be at that moment. Uh, it, the, the surprise of that whole occasion was, was, uh, was Robinson. I couldn't convince him that uh, I was giving him this interview and, uh, and considering him for a job on the on the hit team, the Brooklyn Dodgers. I had to give him an actual picture, by voice, by gesture, but by uh, uh, every means I had, to have him realize what he was in front of and what he was about to agree to. He had to know that he would be called these names and his mother would be attacked, and uh, his ancestry, as I put it. Well, uh, I asked him what he would do. I'd kill him. It was a very resentment that I wanted, and yet he had to realize that he must uh, uh, be able to handle himself under those dark conditions. And there was finally an agreement that for three years, he would undertake to turn the other cheek, and we defined what that meant in actual field play. Under Ricky's orders, Jackie will be forced to restrain his desire to fight back when he's insulted or threatened with physical violence. Robinson agrees and signs his contract with a mixture of exultation and apprehension. 1946, the Montreal Royals, a Brooklyn Dodger farm team, open the season at Jersey City. On their playing roster is baseball's most controversial new figure, Jackie Robinson. 
spring training has been a harrowing experience for Robinson. During the barnstorming tour in the South, he has been reviled by fans and shunned by his own teammates. But in the season ahead, he will channel his anger and humiliation into a driving determination that will become the trademark of Jackie Robinson. The Brooklyn Dodgers and Montreal Royals begin spring training in Panama. Largely because of Robinson, Branch Rickey has been forced to move his teams out of the traditional training grounds in the South. Robinson knows there is resistance against him. Dodger players have signed a petition protesting his appearance on the field. The challenge of acceptance by his teammates, that was the first hurdle that had to be made. And there was the petition on the club. We've never advertised that. Uh, Dixie Walker, an eminent gentleman, and Stanky, a mobile boy, and they were opposed to it. A tremendous opposition to it at the time. Uh, I didn't decide to, uh, to put him on the Brooklyn Club until a Saturday before the opening on Tuesday of the National League season. That first day, I tried to tell myself it was just another game. I tried to blot out the sounds and the excitement, but I couldn't do it. There was so much riding on this game, not only for me, but for Mr. Rickey. I could see Mr. Rickey catching every ball with me. He kept urging me to be more aggressive. He was such an inspiration to me, I know I couldn't have made it without him. Jackie Robinson proves he can hold his own on the playing field. But he is still the outcast, forced to live in separate hotels. He has no roommates and is known as the loneliest man in baseball. Forced to turn the other cheek, he must let his baseball ability speak for him. the fans from Flatbush begin to accept Jackie Robinson, and so do his teammates. Says Branch Rickey, the players rallied to his defense, and it caused the glue on the club that molded them into a pennant-winning team. For the Brooklyn Dodgers, it's the first pennant in six years. Brooklyn fans shower their affection on the beloved bum. Jackie Robinson crowns his first season in the Major Leagues by being named Rookie of the Year. Branch Rickey couldn't ask for anything more. The season has been exhausting. Though he is the first Negro to play in Major League Baseball, Robinson has earned just $5,000. To supplement his income, he sells home appliances. As a national sports figure, Jackie has taken it upon himself to shoulder a further responsibility. The Brotherhood movement is gaining ground every day. It is slowly and surely becoming a fact and not remaining just a theory. And I'm glad that I can report from my own personal experiences on the baseball diamond that the feeling of intolerance no longer exists. By 1949, Robinson has paved the way for others to follow. Men like catcher Roy Campanella and pitcher Don Newcomb. The Negro's position in baseball is secure. Branch Rickey removes all restrictions, and 1949 is Robinson's year. It better be rough on me, Jackie declares, because I'm going to be rough on them. Almost overnight, Jackie becomes the holler guy, the spark plug behind Brooklyn victory. July 1949. 
Jackie Robinson is unexpectedly cast into the political spotlight. With his wife, Ray, by his side, the mature and confident Jackie Robinson testifies before the House Un-American Activities Committee. I've been asked to express my views on Paul Robeson's statement in Paris to the effect that American Negroes would refuse to fight in any war against Russia because we love Russia so much. I haven't any comment to make except that any event of war with Russia, Negroes and our Italians and Irish and Jews and Swedes and Slavs and other Americans would act just as all these groups did in the last war. They'd do their best to keep their country out of war if unsuccessful, they'd do their best to help their country win the war against Russia or any other enemy that threatened us. The 1950s. In his new home in suburban Stamford, Connecticut, Jackie savors the rewards of years of struggle. He is an established major league star, earning a major league salary in five figures. In the off season, he can relax with his family enjoying economic security he never knew in childhood. And for his son, there will be no need to play baseball with broom handles and rags. Jackie is imbued with a nagging sense of responsibility. He feels he must speak out where injustice has been done. His friend and teammate, Roy Campanella, often disagrees with Jackie. I'm no crusader, says Campanella. I'm just a baseball player. Robinson will not tolerate this attitude. He has always been a fighter, he will continue to be a fighter. A man must speak out for what he believes, says Jackie. Robinson is now more than a ball player. He is, by circumstance, a representative of his race. We were put through the usual bag of tricks right in this state. At first, we were told that the house we were interested in had been sold just before we inquired or we would be invited to make an offer, a sort of a seal bid, and then we'd be told that the offers higher than ours had been turned down. Then we tried buying houses on the spot for whatever price was asked. They handled, they handled this by telling us the house had been taken off, taken off the market. And once we met a broker who told us he would, he would like to help us find a home, but his clients were against selling to Negroes. And whether or not we got a story, with the refusal, the re results were always the same. He is praised for his explosive play in the field, but is sometimes criticized for deliberately engaging in controversy. Jackie is a guy who likes to mouth off, many say. He's a troublemaker. And Jackie himself admits, my temper cost me my popularity. 1955, Jackie Robinson is 36. He is the elder statesman of the Dodgers. He occupies a center locker, a special mark of distinction. Nine hectic years in the majors have been filled with controversy. In the twilight of his baseball career, reporters call him the old gray fat man. His legs lack speed, agility. His reflexes are sluggish. however, clinch the National League pennant late in September. Once more, they will face the Yankees in the World Series. For Jackie Robinson, there may not be another. Since 1947, the Dodgers have won the pennant four times. And four times they have lost to the New York Yankees in the World Series. The experts predict the Dodgers will be beaten for the fifth consecutive time. The Dodgers are an old team, they say, virtually unchanged since 1947. Even the most loyal Dodger rooters are skeptical. But in this World Series, the 36-year-old Jackie Robinson flashes the daring speed that recalls the Robbie of old. by 
Robinson, the Dodgers win the 1955 World Series. Writes one reporter, the old gray fat man had done what he wanted. He had shown the Dodgers, he had shown the Yankees, he had shown the world. By the end of 1956, after a furious decade in baseball, Jackie Robinson has decided to retire. I had decided that I'd used up the good years. I didn't want to work out the string as a pinch hitter or a part-time player. Most of all, I wanted security for my family. I had considered the possibility of becoming a manager, but when the president of Chock Full of Nuts, Mr. William Black, offered me a job as vice president in charge of personnel, I was so impressed by the man and the company that I decided to start my new career here. What appealed to me most was that I wasn't being hired in order to have my name adorn a letterhead, but I was being asked to join the company and become an integral part of the organization. The job was and still is a challenge, but that's the way I like it. Generally, I meet with Mr. Black to go over new employee programs, brief him on my activities, and discuss new company policies, or to get an occasional bawling out. I rarely miss baseball. I just don't have the time to miss it. But if I did, it would be the playing. I never felt comfortable as a spectator. Looking back now on my days in baseball, I can remember times when I was advised not to press issues or speak out when I felt it was necessary. But I couldn't do that. I believe that a man is judged on more than the power of his hands and legs. He's judged also on the strength of his mind and his character. Not to speak out when I saw or felt an injustice would have been as bad as taking the third strike every time I came to bat. Right now, if I had the chance to live my life over again, I'd live it the same way. In July of 1962 at Cooperstown, New York, Jackie Robinson receives baseball's highest honor. He is elected to the Hall of Fame. He sees it as the crowning achievement of his career. Says Jackie Robinson, this is the proudest day of my entire life.